were producers. They produced artsy fartsy movies. <laughs> My mother, she kids me. She says, John, the budget for one of your movies is more than the budget for all 35 of our movies that we produce. <laughs> I remind her that so is the box office, but you know, it doesn't go with your favorite. Right? <laughs> but what I was able to do is to watch my parents see television as a new entertainment medium. And for them to look at ways to innovate what was being broadcast. Because when they started out, television was awash with reality shows, news, and very little else. Sounds like today. <laughs> what they did is they brought long-form narrative to the television screen. They put great American plays on television, waiting for Godot, the Iceman coming. And that was their innovation. That's what separated them from what was going on at the time. And I watched my parents go through this, this ma magical balancing act of, of being true to a story, which is so important, but finding new ways to distribute those and sharing those stories with an audience. We all have stories to tell. We have to find the ways to share those. The first movie that I was lucky enough to work on out of college was a movie I learned something on it that I'll always remember. It was a movie called Beat Street. It was a breakdancing movie. It wasn't, wasn't very successful. But I was asked at the end of it through a series of circumstances. I started out as a gopher, a PA, go for this, go for that. But I was asked to stay on and supervise post-production. Now, I knew nothing about post-production. I didn't tell them that. But I did. I, I stayed on. And in the middle of it, we had a, a date that we had to hit to make the film screen at the Cannes Film Festival. And our music editor came to me. And the music editor said to me, John, we're not going to make our delivery date. Now, I was all of 23, maybe 24 years old at the time, so I knew exactly what to do. And I said, come on, we'll go tell the producer. And we watched, marched into the producer's office, David Pickler, and I said, David, Tom here tells me we're not going to make our delivery day. Well, David didn't get upset. David looked at me very matter-of-factly, and he said, John, I paid the two of you to tell me how things can get done, not that they can't get done. And he walked out. And you know what? We made our delivery day. And he, I cannot tell you how many times that I have thought about that story on, on films that I later produced in, in my career, especially on Titanic, where the task in front of us at so many different times seemed unsurpassable. But Titanic was an opportunity for us to wrap an audience in a tragic love story that had a, a thematic tale and actually a moral tale for the turn of the century, that technology and, and technological brilliance alone is not the answer. To accommodate the needs of the production, we, we scoured the world. We looked around the world, where could we make this movie? So we finally found a place in Rosarito, Mexico, the least likeliest of places to film a movie called Titanic. But it was on the ocean, it was 40 acres of barren land, and we decided that we would build a tank there. And we would build our set within that tank. And we would then use technology to bring the ship to life. But first what we had to do was we had to build the ship itself. I want to share with you a time-lapse video of the ship being built for Titanic. If we could run the first clip, please. <coughs> Where the ship itself is going to be built. Because we were building the ship, 
we also felt this was the place to do the Southampton dock scene. So inside the tank, before it was filled with water, we built the dock. We faced the ship into the prevailing winds, which I'll, I'll show you later on. But we also only finished one side of the ship because we had the ocean on the other side and could never shoot the other way. And throughout the movie, we were continually flopping the film to create the illusion of the look on the other side. So sometimes technology is not always the answer. You go back to the old-fashioned tricks, tricks of the trade. What you'll see, we built the ship into two different sections. We built the front section of the ship that weighed about two million pounds. It was important to have that front section because later on, we put those, that part of the ship on an hydro hydraulic jacking system that raised and lowered it into the sinking water where Billy Zane is, is there. You see it now being jacked up into its position. The funnels on top of the ship are six stories tall to give you a sense of the scale. When you would drive over a hill from about two miles away from the studio, you saw this bohemian sitting there against the water, and it was it. Titanic was really there herself. It was a great motivating factor for the crew. We turned to a lot of the old resources from the period itself when the ship was built. For example, the davits that raise and lower the lifeboat. We used the original davit maker from 1912 to build the depths, because we needed these depths to work. We were putting 30, 40 people in lifeboats and lowering them down. And we had to do it repeatedly, and we had to do it safely. Safety was always our first concern. It turned into a 24-hour-a-day operation. The second set of the ship we built was the stern of the ship. This we built as a giant teeter top. And this is where Kate and Leo on the ship at the end, and the ship tilts up. We had a green screen at the bottom so we could digitally add the whole ship. You'll see this go up and down in a second. To show everybody that I felt it was safe, the first night we were using it, I had my wife and my eight-year-old son at the time on the tilted boot deck. Now, sure enough, first night it got stuck in the up position. <laughs> I was going, what did I do? What did I do? There you go. The people enjoyed it so much they wanted to know if they could get a ride on like an e ticket ride at Disney. Thank you.